Welcome to SMILE. My name is Megan Reynolds. I'm the Deputy Friend of the Court for Calhoun County. Also with me today is Claire Metzger, who is a um, social worker who works for the Friend of the Court and serves in the role of investigator and also as instructor for this SMILE program. SMILE, as you know, um, is ordered by the court for all parties and cases involving children in divorces in particular and as we expand this program, we're hoping to make it available to those in other cases, including custody and paternity cases. The goal of the program is to provide you with um, workable information, uh, the benefit of many years of experience in working with families who are going through family separation with young children, and as the title suggests, to start making it livable for everyone. Some people take exception to the name SMILE. It seems like it's asking a lot, maybe too much too soon. And that's not really the focus. The focus really is the full title of the program, which is to start making it livable for everyone and to work toward that goal, even if it takes some time for some families. So what we're going to cover today, um, I'm going to provide a basic friend of the court orientation. Some of the materials that we'll be covering today will be local and are about Calhoun County procedures and Calhoun County Friend of the Court. Uh, the Start Making It Livable for Everyone video is going to be found at the link that has that title for the statewide SMILE program. For the first time, because of the COVID pandemic, we're able to make these materials available online without need for an in-person class in the courthouse. Um, you'll get more information about that um, as we go along, but you're going to start as you have with this link and then move back to the website to open the link for the Start Making It Livable for Everyone statewide curriculum. At the end of that video, after the video ends, including the credits, you will close the video and behind it will be a, a, a new pop-up that has um, at the Michigan Child Support website, the My Child Support website, which is where you'll be taken to when you follow that link, there will be um, a field for you to fill out your name and your email and your case docket number, the docket that it was, has been assigned to your court case. And that is how our office will be alerted that you have completed the requirement to attend this program, that you've watched the entire video, um, and that email that you provide, be careful that you enter it correctly, will be where we send your uh, acknowledgement that you have completed the requirement. We will also take care of uh, recording for your court file for the purposes of your court file that you've met the requirement. So be careful, uh, don't just close the video and walk away, uh, wait for that video to close all the way out and then go back to um, the window that's behind the video, which is where you'll have the option to enter in your name and email. We also have at our website where you started from this to activate this link, the resources and reading materials for this class that you can download from there, including the brochure that I'll reference um, a few times in terms of how you get friend of the court approval for your final orders and other reading materials that will be mentioned by Claire Metzger as she presents the small curriculum. So to go through um, some of the local information about the friend of the court and our role in Calhoun County and your court case, right now you're in what we call the pre-judgment phase of your case, either a divorce case or custody case, they follow a similar path. You can think of it sort of as shoots and ladders if you remember that game from childhood. There is a scenario where um, you move through the stages of the case relatively quickly in an amicable uh, situation where the parties uh, have a basic agreement about the terms of their separation and the custody and parenting time and support arrangements for their children. And there are other scenarios where there are more steps along the way where there's more formal litigation, where there's mediation that's formal, etc. But either way, while you're in this stage, the friend of the court doesn't have an active role in your case unless you have a temporary court order that requires enforcement 
that would be a temporary custody order or a temporary child support order. Or if in high conflict cases, the judge has appointed the friend of the court to investigate custody related issues. Uh, we have also been delegated responsibility at the very end of the prejudgment case to review all orders. So review your judgment of divorce, review your proposed custody order to ensure that the orders comply with Michigan law. Uh, as I'll describe, you, you will send, if you are self-representing yourself, you will send um, the proposed orders to the front of the court for review before they go to your judge for signature. If you have an attorney, your attorney is likely to do that for you, um, but this presentation is meant to make you a more knowledgeable partner in working with your attorney as you go through this process. So what happens next? At this stage, one party to your case has made themselves the plaintiff, filed a complaint, and the other party has been named as the defendant and served with the complaint and a proof of service has been filed to indicate that uh, service has been completed. You may be in this middle part here where you're working on the resolution of, of issues. You may be going through mediation. You may be preparing a consent agreement where the two of you have already reached an agreement, or you may be preparing for trial. To finalize a divorce action or any custody action involving a child, you will have final orders. And it's those final orders that contain all the terms for custody and parenting time and child support. If it, there's a divorce matter, there's a final hearing that the plaintiff is required to attend to enter the judgment of divorce. It's at that stage where the friend of the court's review of the accuracy and proper preparation of your orders will happen before the judge will take that final step to finalize your orders. Our role in that process is that we will receive that copy of your proposed orders and during these times, the best way is, is email. Um, it's generally the best way. We were using that before COVID and we'll continue to use it in the future. That email, as you see here, is focapprovals at calhouncountymi.gov. That is um, also further explained in the brochure that you can access back at our website, that FOC approvals brochure. And uh, many people who are representing themselves will uh, be using Michigan Legal Help, which is a free website that helps unrepresented parties uh, prepare their own orders. And that will take you all the way through the preparation of orders, but Michigan Legal Help does not have a calculator for child support built into their um, forms. You have to use the Michigan Child Support calculator um, in order to get to an accurate child support calculation. Um, in the approvals brochure that I hope you'll download from the website, there is clear explanation for how to access that website and use the calculator. Now, a lot of people, when they're going through this process and are unfamiliar with the uh, state's formula for child support, they may make inaccurate sort of um, informal agreements around what they think would be a good result for, for child support. And that may be the best outcome in the end. You may, your intuition may be correct, but I've seen, um, we've seen at the front of the court, many parties who not understanding that the formula contains arrangements for childcare, for health insurance premiums to cover the child, will make an estimate that's pretty wildly inaccurate. And it could, um, it could mean that a party who would have a certain obligation will wind up paying more. Um, and so we really encourage you not to uh, proceed without actually becoming familiar with the calculator, entering in the information about your income, the other party's income, the number of overnights that each parent will be spending with the child, who's paying for childcare, who's paying for health insurance, because that can really affect the result. And you'll, um, you'll have to show your work when it comes time to turning in your calculation, but also it helps you um, work better with your attorney if you're represented, if you understand what goes into it, and it helps you work with the other party if you're both unrepresented in understanding what goes into that formula. Once you have that calculation, you have to copy those, the, the detailed results onto the order, and that all goes to the friend of the court along with your final proposed orders. 
uh, one question that comes up frequently um, is where parties to a divorce action or a custody action already have a child support case that was initiated by the prosecutor. Some parents have been living apart for long enough that that kind of order may already exist um, before they file their divorce or custody case. Um, if, in that instance, you do still need a support order to go along with your divorce or custody action. It will take the place of the other one. So even if the numbers are not going to change, even if you just within weeks or months uh, developed a child support order through a support case, you will need to um, either recalculate support based on any changes that have occurred in that interim or uh, provide us a new support order that matches those numbers. This is what the Uniform Child Support Order actually looks like. And I'll briefly um, point out the important parts of it. Um, again, if you're representing yourself or if you're working with your attorney to make sure this is complete, things you wanna pay attention to are that you are including your case number here in this box for case number, that you're fully filling out these caption boxes for your information. And very importantly, the source of income for the parties. Um, when we receive these orders at the front of the court, we'll be setting up the withholding that's required. Um, and the more accurate the source of information is, the better, because um, any delays in from the time the order is signed to when we begin to collect child support will create arrears for the party who has the obligation and will cause delays in receiving support for the party who is the payee in the case. So uh, check to make sure that you're not just using the address where somebody physically works, but that that doesn't correspond to where the human resources office is or the corporate office where these should actually be directed. Um, in this middle portion of the order is where it's very important to name which party is the payer and which party is the payee. We're going to name each child and the child's date of birth and the number of overnights that the, the uh, child has with the parent. And um, there are situations where an older child may spend more overnights with a parent than a younger child, or there may be a split custody arrangement. So that is why that detail is there. And then each child has his or her own column um, where each of the components of child support is laid out. And that way when the child comes of age or if the child reaches an age where by the formula, child care is no longer available after the age of 12, then friend of the court can make those adjustments as we go along. So there's a lot of detailed information. Um, it's not to be rushed through and you'll wanna carefully uh, either work on this on your own if you're self-represented or work on this with your attorney so that the order will be approved when it's submitted. The role of the friend of the court post-judgment after your, you have your final judgment of divorce or your final custody order is that we enforce custody and parenting time. Um, parenting time cannot be enforced by the friend of the court if it's not specific and detailed in your order. So another thing to consider as you're um, getting ready to finalize your, your case is um, whether you should have the detailed uh, schedule that you'll be following for parenting time or whether you're going to leave that open-ended and use language like reasonable parenting time. If you use language like reasonable parenting time or at the agreement of the parties, if the agreements break down, you'll need another court order to supply those details. If you supply the details, then anytime a parent may wrongfully deny the other parent an exchange of the child, the court and the friend of the court can act to enforce the details of the agreement right away. Um, friend of the court uh, wants to emphasize that Calhoun County does not have a standard parenting time that applies in all cases. So if you leave out detail, we're not gonna have some external reference that provides the details. Um, there is a commonly followed schedule that you, some of your attorneys may talk to you about involving every other weekend and a midweek visit and a schedule of holidays, um, but that is not a default parenting time order. Again, if you don't contain the details in your order, they will not be there, they will not be enforceable. Um, we also enforce the child support and medical support, and then we review and modify child support orders as needed um, it's important to say there that if you have a change of circumstances, if you have a loss of employment, if you have a change in which party is carrying the health insurance, um, you have to act promptly to let friend of the court know that so that we can make adjustments in your calculation. 
um, some parties will rely upon us getting information that you've lost the job and acting on our own to make a change to your child support. And that's the, a court order is going to continue to be enforced until a court order is changed. So uh, we don't have uh, administrative flexibility to be able to just simply stop charging child support. You have to promptly act to get a new order in, in place, either by working through the courts or initiating a support review with a friend of the court. Uh, all parties in all cases are ordered to update their addresses and contact information from the friend of the court while your child remains a minor throughout the course of the case um, so that uh, we have accurate information where we can provide notices to you and it's in your own interest to keep that updated so that you don't miss any notices of hearing that could uh, possibly go on without you. In terms of communicating with the friend of the court, um, again, our, we, our office is fully open at this time after the COVID crisis um, and the courts reopened. Um, however, um, the My Child Support website, which is the website you will be using to access the, the longer video that um, contains the full small curriculum, uh, is a website that you can use to essentially create online access to your uh, child support account that's similar to any other online banking account you might set up. You will create a PIN, you'll be able to log in, see what payments were received, monitor the activity on your case, monitor any activity around enforcement, et cetera. And it's very detailed and it's the best way to get real time 24 seven access to your case. Um, please look at the brochure that's um, back at our website so that you can um, begin to register and set that up. Uh, phone access to the friend of the court is um, available. It will go to what we have as a call center and for triage of, of calls and which level of support is needed for that call. Any questions that can't be immediately answered will be forwarded to the, our caseworker. So the, I'm going to transition now to um, turning this over to Claire. Um, one of the things we want to emphasize is that um, this course is meant to give general information for families, but we know that some families are experiencing um, level of crisis or difficulty that is not necessarily fully addressed in these materials. Um, some Families are experiencing domestic violence, mental illness, substance abuse among one of the parties, and there may be steps that need to be taken before that parent can fully exercise their parenting time. Um, but we're trying to cover some areas that commonly arise in families as they separate, and we acknowledge that every family is different and has their own story. So I'm gonna uh, turn this over to Claire. Oh, I'm sorry, I was waiting for the slide. <laughs> Thank you. Again, um, every family is unique. Every family has their own story. And the courts are very clear about that and want to ensure um, as best as the court can assist parties in making sure that orders get entered that reflect the unique circumstances for each and every family. The SMILE program was developed to provide parents with some information to help them better understand how conflict between the parties impacts the children and to provide some information on how to uh, look at things perhaps from a different perspective and work towards uh, an ability to become effective co-parents for your child or children so that your, your children will um, not only get through this difficult time with you, but come out with strong relationships with both parents. The following will be some information for you, you to consider in your particular situation. And sometimes when parties decide to separate, there is a significant amount of animosity or just difficulty in communicating. And unfortunately, sometimes that means a child is placed in the middle 
with feeling as though they have to choose a side or choose a parent. And it's really important to understand that children simply want to love their parents. Children have the right to be able to do that. And in the, the video that you will be watching, uh, this will reinforce, uh, there's one young lady who talks about very clearly that she didn't want to have to choose either parent. It's clear that she loved both of her parents and the discord between the parents was very distressing. You need to love your child more than you dislike the other parent. Um, often I will get calls from parents who are upset that the other parent is, is wanting to, uh, for example, take the child out of state on a vacation. If, if the other parent comes to you and makes a request or there's some discussion about the child and the child's needs, please take a moment um, not to knee jerk, which we all do, especially when we're upset. But if you need to, to, to just close down the conversation so you have a moment to think it through and think through, is this in my child's best interest? Um, for example, we had a, a parent recently contact who wanted to take their children out of state. They were able to um, make plans to take them to some national monuments um, and, and take them to a part of the country that the children had never been to. And upon reflection, the, the mother agreed for that to happen, even though it meant that there would need to be some shuffling of the typical parenting time schedule. She did that because she believed it was in the children's best interest. The other thing, when you allow your child to simply love the other parent, and the other parent may have some issues, but the child doesn't necessarily recognize or know that, they just want to love their parent. And by allowing your child to come home, be excited about what they did at the other parent's house, uh, be willing to talk about um, the, the, the things that they do with the other parent, this helps to forge a stronger bond actually between you and the child because the child then receives a very clear message that it's okay for them to talk about the other parent. And by sharing this information, uh, a bond gets forged more strongly between you and that child because they know they can come to you with anything related to the other parent. Bashing the other parent or a step parent certainly is not an effective anything when it comes to a child. You're bashing a person this child loves and that may actually serve to interfere with the bond between you and that child because they get the opposite message that it's not good to tell this parent much about what happens with the other parent because they will be very negative. They will make me feel bad about the good times that I have with the parent. So I will just stop talking to the parent. And if I stop talking to the parent about what happens in the other home, what else might I stop talking to that parent about? So it really is in your best interest and your child's to maintain that open communication and allow them to express the, the joys, maybe there's some challenges with the other, other parents' home, uh, but that, that maintains a strong bond between you and that child. Talking to children about divorce or separation is never easy. You're in distress and you, now, now you're having to handle your child's distress as well. We have at the FOC uh, link that Megan talked about previously, a bibliography of some books and other resources that are geared for children at different age and developmental levels. So you can, can pick and choose from that list what resources appear to make the most sense based on where your child is at. Certainly when you do talk to them about the separation or the divorce, 
you will use words aimed at their developmental ability, um, words that they understand. And if they don't understand, you need to certainly, for example, ask if they have any questions so that you can gauge as a parent how much they're taking in. Are they understanding truly what's going on or not? And if not, then perhaps uh, you know then to, to try a different tack with them to help them get to that understanding. There is no right or wrong way for a child to feel about the situation and certainly reinforcing that you as a parent, you will be there for that child no matter what they feel, no matter what they want to say, you are going to be there for them and just listen to what they have to say. Certainly paying attention not only to the words that your child uses, but their demeanor as well. Are there changes in your child's typical activities? Are they becoming more withdrawn? Do they seem sad all the time? Or they could become very aggressive and very active as though they are so busy in to these other activities that they don't have the time to dwell on what's going on between their parents. What I have found to be helpful with parents is that if you have the ability to communicate with the other parent, check things out with them. Uh, give them a call and say, hey, I, I'm seeing these kinds of behaviors with our child. What are you seeing? What steps have you taken to support them? Do you have any suggestions? Uh, see if the two of you can, can work out a joint action to better support the child. If you can't do that, or if the child's behaviors become concerning, um, they're not eating, they're getting into trouble in school or in the community, and your efforts seem to have limited impact. We have some excellent family counselors in the Calhoun County area. Don't hesitate to seek out counseling assistance. It sometimes helps to sit down with someone who has specific expertise in dealing with children and families in difficult circumstances to, to get a different perspective, get some suggestions about how to better support your child. And in the long run, you yourself feel more competent and effective as a parent. Counseling does not have to be a lengthy process. It could be very targeted to the specific circumstances going on, but that is something that you would jointly determine with the counselor. Sometimes communication it is fairly easy between parents that separate. Sometimes it is very difficult, and there are many reasons why that is. Bottom line though, think of the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Treat that other parent the way I want to be treated by that parent. And the hope is that by your example, given a level of discord between the parents, the other parent will pick up on this. I am being respected by the other parent, therefore I'm more inclined to extend that respect to them. Using I statements is very useful as well. I know sometimes when conversations get heated, it's easy to say, well, you do this or you didn't do that. Um, that's not very helpful. If you think about it, when somebody does that to you, you feel uh, attacked, you feel on the defensive. So it's hard for you to really hear what that other person is saying. So you have a better chance of having an effective result from a conversation with the other parent if you come at it from, you know, I, I feel concerned when I understand that a certain behavior is happening in the other parent's home. I feel concerned that perhaps you're not able to spend as much time with our child um, as the child requires. So how can we address that together instead of putting it on the other parent as though um, the other parent doesn't care 
or doesn't have any ability to address the concern at hand. For the families where communication is pretty much broken down and trying to do even a phone conversation, let alone an in-person conversation, simply isn't either safe or effective, there are some good alternate means to communicate. Certainly email and text are good. There is also a program called Our Family Wizard. Our Family Wizard is, is recommended by a number of courts within the state of Michigan because it has a number of um, functions to the program. Uh, one is just a direct communication access but there is also a section where you can put in all the information related to the child or the children, such as insurance information, provider information, emergency contact information. There would be a calendar area where people can simply put in activities for the child, such as conferences this day, this time. Um, soccer game is Thursday at six. That way both parties can access it at any time and no one can say that they didn't know about an activity because it's already been put into the calendar. And it would also give parents a chance to question uh, if, if there's an issue related to parenting time pickup, for example, because an activity runs over into the other parent's parenting time. So if there's some logistics that need to be worked out, hopefully you have some time to do that. It is really important for parents to understand that a decrease in communication could mean an increase in a child who is feeling that now they can make decisions on their own about who they're going to see, how late they're going to stay up. Um, being online on social media platforms that may not be appropriate for that child. Uh, this is because mom and dad are too busy focused on their arguing with one another to really pay attention to the supervision and the structure that is needed for the child to ensure that they're not uh, inadvertently getting themselves into some difficult situations. At the end of the day, it's easiest with two. As a single parent, if you try to do everything on your own, you find that you end up being uh, potentially more tired, um, feeling more overwhelmed. You never get a moment or, or some time for yourself. When you have two parents, you then when the, the child or children are with the other parent, you have time to take care of some things that you need to take care of apart from the children. You have time to rest, rejuvenate, pursue some activities that are, are meant for you, um, but you couldn't do because you had to be there to supervise the children, for example. And ultimately, you have that other person to bounce some things off. Um, I'm concerned because uh, the child is not doing well in a class. Um, have you discussed this with the child? What should we both tell the child so we're sending the same message that we both are aware and we both are concerned, for example? It is so much easier when you have that other person uh, to be able to work with. especially in a time where parents are separating or divorcing, stability and predictability are going to be very, very crucial. This is a time where a child's world has essentially imploded. They have no power in this and chances are they don't really totally understand how all this is going to work because chances are mom and dad don't really understand it either. But to the extent that mom and dad can provide some stability and predictability, that is going to assist your children in getting through this with as little distress as possible. One of the ways that you can do this is to provide a calendar. Now for young children, for example, having a, a paper calendar 
might make the most sense where you can color code a calendar and mark the times when the child is with you, when the child is with the other parent, uh, if there's any other activities where um, one or both of the parents would be in attendance. And you can help the child prepare that on this day and this time, you're gonna get to spend time with the other parent. Isn't that great? Or if your child seems to be ambivalent, you, you have some time to talk to them and, and try to, to help them articulate what concerns might be. So the child knows what's happening and they are prepared for, for what is to happen. For older children, shared calendars can be used through phones, through Our Family Wizard, and there's another program called Wonderlist where calendars can be used and you can make it so that only parents could access or the children themselves, if they are older, can put in appointments or extracurricular activities uh, so that both parents know what's going on. And that helps the older child to feel a bit more in control of the circumstance because they know what's going on and they have an ability to help set their schedule. If mom and dad struggle to the point where they are not effectively co-parenting, uh, certainly counseling is something that could be uh, a, a benefit to the parents. Again, this is when we are not talking about incidences where there is active domestic violence, there may be a personal protection order that is in place or um, any other reason where one of the parents may not be able to effectively participate in that. However, it is a good way for mom and dad to find support to put aside their personal feelings with each other and, and be supported to find ways to become effective co-parents for their children. And mistakes are gonna happen. So parents need to give benefit of the doubt, be flexible. In the video that you will see, uh, there is a, an example of uh, a young mom who um, was called by the child to pick the child up it wasn't her time, it was the father's time to take care of it. But instead of grousing to the child that the parent wasn't holding up the, their end of the bargain or calling the other parent immediately to get after them, uh, her response was, I don't know what's going on. Bottom line is I'm gonna take care of my child first and we'll sort it out later. Uh, and, and the example included where that father who was supposed to have taken the child, called the mother and said, wow, I blew it. I am so sorry. I apologize. And this was all set up because mom focused on the child's needs and knew that whatever the issue was could be sorted out at a later time. One of the, the other areas that Friend of the Court does get questions on is the issue of blended families. And the question comes up, when is a good time for me to introduce my love interest to the children? You really need to let children be the guide. As you need time to grieve the loss of a relationship, so do your children. And children grieve differently than, than parents do. Uh, it may take some time for the child to accept that their life is different now and be able to be open to developing a relationship with another adult who is in a romantic relationship with their parent. If, if the child is struggling, certainly counseling, again, may be uh, available or appropriate uh, for you and the child to discuss concerns with um, having another person entering into their life. 
one of the ways that you can also support a child to be more accepting is to make sure that you spend one-on-one -on -one time on a regular and consistent basis with that child. They need to know that they are extremely important to their parent, no matter what. And having that one-on-one -on -one time helps reassure them that I matter to my parent. And sometimes because of that, then that allows them the green light to be more willing to at least try to develop a relationship with a new romantic relationship. For the other parent, understanding that a step parent or um, boyfriend, girlfriend for the other parent is not an enemy. This person is going to be in a position potentially to help care for your child. And it is to your advantage to try to develop a positive relationship with that person. If there are concerns, certainly attempting to address them with the other parent, or again, if, if the situation warrants it, certainly seeking out some family counseling with how are we going to bring the families together? How are the two parents going to work together? How, how is this all going to fit? I, that is the end. I okay. probably had thank, one more. Thank you, Claire. So I'm all done, sorry. <laughs> that's, the, that's the last slide and thank you for the presentation. These are the kind of um, points that we usually cover in class along with the viewing of the video to bring out the, the, the really the best practices and the best wisdom that we can uh, from what you'll see as the video that is your next, next stop. So from here, when you close out this video, you're going to move to the next link, which will take you to a film that uses the stories of families, um, some of whom Claire has mentioned, that are families from Oakland County who are receiving services from uh, Calhoun County Friend of the Court, and some of the judges and um, providers and attorneys who are working with those families and families like them as they navigate this. We think that you have um, you know, a lot to benefit from that film, and this is also try to bring out some of the points that are that are um, covered in that film, as well as the local information about how to access our services. So if you have questions as you proceed along with trying to uh, finalize your orders, please use that Friend of the Court Approvals website to send drafts, to send questions. We will be responsive to them and try to get you through this process. The last thing we want is for, um, for for you to have established a case, worked out all the details, be ready to finalize it and get hung up on paperwork. So again, whether you're working with an attorney or especially if you're representing yourselves, please use that website um, so that we can, I'm sorry, that email so that we can communicate and receive your drafts and get you through the end of this process. Thank you for your attention today and best of luck to you in the future.